Okay, so this segment focuses on models for core complex development and their evolution over time. So to begin, any model of core complex development has to answer three main questions that are based on the geologic features and core complexes we discussed in the last video segment. Firstly, a model would need to explain the domal morphology of core complexes. This is a characteristic feature of them that shows up globally, not just in the Whipple Mountains case. Secondly, the model needs to explain the relationship between lower plate ductile rocks and the brittle detachment fault above them. And then thirdly, a model needs to try and understand the primary dip on the detachment while it was active, whether it was shallow to begin with or whether it slipped at a steep angle and then later rotated into a shallow angle after slip. So let's start with how models have explained why core complexes are domed. Uh, there's actually pretty good consensus on the idea that the doming is an isostatic response to the extensional process. That is, as the upper crust gets thinner and thinner, something needs to fill in that space in order to retain isostatic equilibrium. The uncertainty, though, lies in what depth that isostatic compensation occurs, whether it's via asthenospheric mantle flow, with the idea that the whole lithosphere is extending essentially equal amounts, or alternatively, whether it's via lower crustal flow, in which case extension occurs primarily uh, in the crust and the mantle remains unaffected. In that instance, you would end up with a moho that remains flat, whereas in the instance of asthenospheric mantle flow and compensation, the moho should be uh, curved and antiformal like the detachment itself. Which of these models dominates is still somewhat debated. That said, it seems like both have contributed because the observations are at the present day are that on the one hand, it's clear the whole lithosphere is thinned compared to the adjacent Colorado Plateau, as we discussed in an earlier segment. But at the same time, seismic reflection data from parts of the basin and range also show that the Moho is quite flat beneath some of the largest core complex, like uh, the Snake Range core complex, for example. So both forms of isostatic compensation must have been important here, but the ratio between the two is not very well understood. The reason we care, though, is, of course, it has important implications for the rheology of the lower crust, the observation of a flat moho suggests that the lower crust is weak or essentially fluid enough to provide the necessary isostatic compensation over extensional timescales. So now let's consider models for the relationship between the detachment and the myelinites. One of the earliest models was this idea of pure shear extension brought forth by Elizabeth Miller. She suggested that perhaps core complexes and their detachments don't represent large amounts of displacement. Perhaps instead, they're just a surface that marks the brittle ductile transition that is exhumed to the surface through pure shear thinning and uh, erosion. The trouble with this model, though, is that these core complexes all show evidence for dominant simple shear. They have strong shear sense indicators and many of them show evidence for many tens of kilometers of displacement along them. The Whipple detachment, for example, has some displaced markers that suggest over 40 kilometers of displacement accommodated along it. So it's clear there has to be a significant uh, component of simple shear uh, or asymmetric um, shear associated with these features. So then there are two different simple shear models to explain core complexes, one known as the Wernicke model that Sean has already mentioned, in which the low angle detachment is interpreted to extend through the whole lithosphere, including uh, through the mantle lithosphere. And one that's fairly similar, except for the detachment is interpreted to sole down into the middle crust rather than through the whole lithosphere, um, which was uh, proposed by uh, Gordon Lister and Greg Davis. I'll focus on this one just because the sketch is a bit better labeled, but overall they share the same uh, general characteristics. So the idea is that at the early onset of extension, 
there's a curved or listric low angle normal fault that traverses the upper crust and that hosts several higher angle normal faults in its hanging wall. The detachment fault soles down to the middle crust where it meets the brittle ductal transition, below which rocks are deforming ductally and forming myelinites also in the same extensional uh, regime. Then as extension continues, the detachment fault starts to warp into an antiformal geometry due to isostatic compensation, and it simultaneously starts to exhume the middle crustal myelinites that were originally uh, beneath the detachment below the brittle ductal transition. And then eventually as extension continues further, uh, the once green schist facies rocks that were below the brittle ductal transition now reaches the surface and the detachment fault flanks a topographic high point and is itself surrounded uh, by normal fault blocks uh, that formed in the hanging wall. So ultimately this model suggests that the relationship between the detachment fault and the myelinites is that they're both related to extension of the continent, but the detachment itself is essentially capturing uh, the brittle ductal transition region and below, um, which on this diagram is shown as a gray bar. So then coming to the question as to the original dip of the detachment fault while it was active, both the Wernicke and Lister and Davis models predict that detachment faults are active at low angles, but we'll talk in the next mini lecture about why many people argue against this concept and why it's considered somewhat of a tectonic conundrum uh, in the community. But I just want to note that to get around this problem, some workers have suggested a model known as the rolling hinge model in which the detachment changes its dip from steep to shallow in a hinge-like geometry and that it only actively slips along uh, the steep section whereas the shallow section is essentially just along for the ride. It's perhaps easiest to illustrate this with a movie so this is a video of a numerical model in which a rolling hinge type core complex is illustrated. And you can see how as the detachment evolves, it starts to shallow and eventually sections of it become too steep to, or too shallow to slip. So it'll retain one segment that is steep and active and another that is shallow and inactive. But overall, it can still slip and evolve into uh, a classic uh, core complex. So to summarize, there's a general consensus view of core complex development that follows what I showed you from the diagram on the right, but there are still open questions as to whether the detachments sole through the whole lithospheric mantle or just the crust, relatedly whether isostatic compensation occurs in the lower crust or the mantle or both, and there are still remaining questions as we'll discuss in the next lecture as to whether the detachment faults actually slipped at low angles or whether they represent a rolling hinge type of process.